First, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my work today. I'm really excited to tell you about the work that I've been doing as a postdoc in Sterling Churchman's lab, where I've been investigating pre-mRNA splicing orders. Human genes contain on average eight introns, but this can go up to dozens and even sometimes hundreds. In addition, the large majority of human genes undergo alternative splicing, meaning that their transcripts contain different combinations of introns and exons. So given the abundance of introns and the complexity that arises from alternative splicing, one question that we're really interested in is how splicing occurs across all of these introns and whether removal of one intron influences that of its neighbors. Specifically, we've been studying the order in which introns are removed along the transcript. This is really important because it has the potential to influence alternative splicing by modulating the availability of splicing regulatory elements. Many of these elements are located in introns, so the order in which these introns are removed can um, determine how long each element is around to exert its effect. Over the last few years, our group as well as others have found that for pairs of consecutive introns, splicing order does not necessarily follow the order of transcription, meaning that the first intron in a pair is not necessarily the first one to be removed. Now, if we move beyond intron pairs and think about an average gene with eight introns, if splicing order does not follow the order of transcription, this means that there are more than 40,000 possible splicing orders to go from an unspliced pre-mRNA to a fully spliced mRNA. So the first question that we asked is whether multi-intron splicing order is defined or if it happens more stochastically. To measure splicing order across multiple introns, we started with uh, purifying nascent chromatin-associated RNA. And for the purposes of today's talk, I'll focus specifically on post-transcriptional splicing. Once we have nascent RNA, we want to analyze it through sequencing. But one of the reasons why it's been so challenging to study splicing order up until recently is that the reads from Illumina sequencing are typically shorter than the introns themselves. What's been a real game changer is the development of direct RNA nanopore sequencing which yields long reads that span multiple introns. So we applied this protocol to human K562 cells. And here, I'm showing you some example data mapping to one representative gene. On the bottom, you can see the gene structure, where introns are shown as line and exons as rectangles. And then each of these dark blue arrows represents one read or one RNA molecule. Focusing on introns, um, you can see that some of these have already been removed and are shown as lines, whereas others are still present. And many of these reads contain a combination of introns that are still present and introns that have been removed. And it's these partially spliced reads that are really informative in terms of splicing order. Before moving forward, I do want to mention that direct RNA nanopore sequencing still has limited throughput, so we do focus on highly expressed genes. And with the current read length, we can analyze about three to four consecutive introns, which I'll refer to as intron groups. I'll use intron six to eight of the gene DDX39A to walk you through our analysis strategy. As I mentioned, partially spliced reads are the ones that contain information about splicing order. So we start with all splicing patterns in which only one intron has been excised, and we count the number of reads that match each of these patterns. Here, these counts are represented as a heat map, where each line represents uh, one read and each column represents one intron. Now, of these three possible splicing patterns, you can see that one of these is much more frequent than the other two. So we take this information and we start building our splicing order plot, where the x-axis represents the number of introns that have been excised, and the y-axis indicates the identity of the newly excised intron. So here, you can see that the first intron to be excised is usually intron 7. We can then move on to all splicing patterns in which two introns have been excised. And again, there are three possibilities of which one is much more frequent than the other two. This tells us that after intron 7 has been removed, it's usually intron 8 that is next. And then we can add the third and final intron. So on these plots, the thickness and opacity of each line is proportional to a splicing order score, which is obtained by multiplying the frequencies of each intermediate isoform that make up the splicing order of interest. 
Now, of these six possible slicing orders, you can see that one of these is strongly preferred, which is in contrast to what we would expect if slicing order was random um, and each slicing order was used at a similar frequency. So this was really exciting because it was our first indication that multi-intron slicing follows a defined order. We can use a metric called evenness to quantify this where an evenness of one indicates a completely random slicing order, and a lower evenness value indicates that there are some predominant slicing orders. We next applied our analysis strategy to all intron groups that had just sufficient coverage in human K562 cells. And we found similar results, where computing or simulating random slicing orders led to an evenness of one, whereas our measured slicing orders had much lower evenness values, with medians below 0.4 for groups of three or four consecutive introns. So together, these results further indicate that multi-intron slicing follows a defined order or a predetermined order across many transcripts. Now, this is for K562 cells, but we next wondered whether slicing order changes in different cellular contexts, such as between different cell types. So to answer this question, we compared slicing order between K562 and HeLa cells, as well as two time points from human spinal motor neuron differentiation, which respectively correspond to motor neuron progenitors and mature motor neurons. We identified intron groups that are commonly expressed between these four cell types, and for each we extracted the top slicing order. Remarkably, we found that the majority of these intron groups share the same top slicing order in all four cell types that are very different as they come from different cell lineages and are in different cell states. So this suggests that slicing order is largely conserved between different cell types. Interestingly, when we performed a similar analysis between alternative isoforms of the same gene, we again found that there was little variability in slicing order between these different alternative isoforms again emphasizing um, how much slicing order is consistent in different contexts and suggesting that it's under very tight control. So next we asked what features determine or control slicing order. And we reasoned that RNA sequence is likely an important contributor to slicing order. To test this hypothesis, we took advantage of naturally occurring heterozygous variants in human lymphoblast cell lines from different individuals that were part of the Thousand Genome Project. For each cell line, we performed direct RNA nanopore sequencing of chromatin-associated RNA, and then we assigned each read to its allele of origin, which allowed us to ask whether there are slicing order differences between alleles. For each group of three introns, there are six possible slicing orders, as you can see from the example here. So for each allele, we defined a vector composed of the corresponding slicing order scores, and then computed the Euclidean distance between these two alleles. So when the two alleles show the same predominant slicing orders, this leads to a very small distance. Whereas if the two alleles have um, different slicing orders, then we will see a greater distance. So applying this strategy to our entire data set, we identified a substantial number of intron groups that showed moderate to strong differences in slicing order between the two alleles. These results suggest that slicing order is indeed frequently allele-specific, and that RNA sequence does contribute to determining slicing order. Today, I want to tell you about two examples for which we identified strong differences in slicing order between alleles. First, in the gene RPS2, we found that across four different individuals, on one allele, intron 3 is removed after the two downstream introns, whereas on the other allele, there's a slicing order reversal, such that intron 3 is now removed prior to the two downstream introns. So we next sought to identify um, SNPs that are associated with this slicing order. And here you can see a Manhattan plot, where each dot represents one SNP, and I've indicated their relative position in the RPS2 gene uh, below the plot. We found that a number of heterozygous SNPs that are in linkage disequilibrium were significantly associated with the two top slicing orders on each allele, suggesting that some of these SNPs are responsible for the slicing order differences that we see between the two alleles. In the second example, in one cell line, we found a slicing order difference in the gene EIF4G2, 
And interestingly, this individual carries a rare heterozygous variant, three nucleotide upstream of the three prime splice site of intron 16. And at this position, when the reference A is replaced by a G, this is associated with um, reversal of splicing order, such that intron 16 is now removed after intron 17. We're now devising some future experiments that will allow us to validate the causality of um, these variants as well as others in determining splicing order. But together, our allele-specific analyses emphasize that splicing order is indeed at least partially determined by RNA sequence. Okay, so earlier I told you that splicing order is largely consistent between different cell types and alternative isoforms. So next we wanted to understand what is the consequence of disrupting splicing order. To answer this question, we focused on a group of six introns in the gene IFRD2, in which we saw that introns four and nine are typically removed early, prior to the introns that are located between them, which I'll refer to as the middle introns. The question that we asked is what would happen to removal of introns four and nine if we reversed splicing order, such that the middle introns were instead removed first? Now, it's actually quite challenging to uh, force early splicing. So instead, we used CRISPR-Cas9 to introduce a series of deletions in the genomic locus of IFRD2. For each of these deletions, we extracted nascent RNA, performed nanopore sequencing, and then computed the levels of intron 4 or 9 retention. Interestingly, we identified a subset of deletions that led to significantly increased intron 4 retention. And as we made these deletions smaller and smaller, we were able to pinpoint the exact seven nucleotides that are located near the 5' splice site of intron 5, and that when deleted are sufficient to induce not only intron 4 retention, but also retention of introns 2 and 3. This further emphasizes the coordinated nature of splicing, and it also indicates that if intron 5 is removed too early prior to removal of intron 4, this has negative consequences for splicing throughout the transcript. In contrast, for intron 9, we saw that it was only retained if all the middle introns were removed simultaneously, suggesting that there isn't one cis-regulatory element that mediates this effect. Instead, we wondered whether RNA structure might underlie the effect that we're seeing, where in the wild-type RNA, where intron 9 is usually removed early, the completely unspliced pre-mRNA might adopt a secondary structure in which the splice sites of intron 9 are readily accessible. In contrast, if the middle introns are removed too early um, prior to intron 9, this might lead to a different secondary structure in which the splice sites of intron 9 are inaccessible. To test this hypothesis, we used an approach called in vitro DMS map seek, which takes advantage of the chemical DMS that induces modification of nucleotides that are located in single-stranded RNA. These modifications can then be read out through sequencing and allowed us to compute a metric called DMS reactivity, which is high if a nucleotide is usually in an open region of the RNA and low if it's usually in a closed region of the RNA. Today, I'm just gonna show you the results for um, one position in intron 9, where we saw significantly decreased DMS reactivity when the middle introns are removed compared to the wild type. And this position is specifically interesting because it corresponds to one of the branch point adenosines that is bound by the U2SNRMP early on in the splicing process. So these results suggest that when there are splicing order changes, this leads to uh, different uh, secondary structures that might alter the accessibility of the RNA um, for different splicing factors. And this emphasizes how important it is to remove introns in the proper splicing order in order to maintain splicing fidelity and um, to obtain the correct mature mRNA isoform. In conclusion, today I've shown you that multi-intron splicing tends to converge on a few different orders, and that splicing order is conserved between different cell types and is partially determined by RNA sequence. Lastly, we found that splicing order is really important to maintain splicing fidelity. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge everyone in the Trishman lab, especially Sterling, who's been a really fantastic mentor throughout my postdoc, as well as Autumn Koenigs, who contributed to some of the experiments that I show you today. I also want to thank our collaborators and our funding sources, and I want to thank you for your attention.